Welcome to The Unlist. Today we're doing another single fragrance video, long form video on a single fragrance. As I have said many times in the past, whenever I do a dedicated video to one fragrance in the long format, it's usually a bit of a death sentence on the metrics for the channel because people, unless they have a particularly keen interest in a given fragrance, or it's a fragrance that is particularly popular that enough people will want to sit for a length of time listening to watching someone discuss a fragrance usually the long form videos on one perfume is just people will watch a minute of it and then click off so stuff like that is better done with shorts or if you're an instagram user i guess reels but i'm not really into reels or instagram in general and i have a specific format that i do for my shorts and that format doesn't really allow me to get everything I want to get in when I do discuss a fragrance that I think is of particular note. In this case, we are talking about 1997's The Dreamer by Versace, as you can see by the thumbnail and everything else. So why am I wasting another 25 minutes talking about one fragrance? Well. I think uh, Versace the Dreamer is a bit of a pivotal point in the career history of Versace as a designer fragrance brand, not speaking so much in regards to their clothing, their ready to wear and their couture designs. I am the kind of person that doesn't really wear high fashion. I don't make the kind of bread to buy high fashion clothes anyway, so the fragrances are about as far as I get with any designer really. Uh, so I like to separate their fashion career from their fragrance career. To me, they're two separate trains of thought, two separate career paths. They're almost two separate entities. It's just the same person or group of persons oversees both in most cases. Oftentimes, the brain trust behind the fashion label only loosely, loosely supervises the perfumes. And in some cases, if you're owned by L'Oreal, well, then not at all, typically the designer offhands their business to L'Oreal. They're saying, it's your baby, make us money, we don't care. Versace has never been one to do that though. Whether it was Gianni Versace in the beginning or his sister Donatella Versace later on, they have always kept a fairly close eye on the perfume business. And I think that's because the Versace family in general are perfume lovers. I know Donatella herself is a collector uh, she might not be as hardcore of a collector as, say, you know, people on Base Notes or Fragrantica, but she definitely has a large selection of perfumes. She collects, she talks about her favorites and all that stuff. So coming from a person that actually enjoys wearing and collecting perfume, even on a designer level, you can expect some quirks and uniqueness because if the person who's paying the bills to have these things made is someone who enjoys wearing perfume, they're not gonna release bullshit, right? They're just not gonna release bullshit. Even if it is commercialized, even if it is mass appealing, even if it is, you know, generally not super challenging, not super uh, unique in many aspects, there's gonna be a level of quality to it because it's coming from someone who, like I said, enjoys wearing perfume and wouldn't want something they wouldn't wear, you know, they wouldn't put their name on something basically if they wouldn't wear it, right? Or wouldn't recommend for someone else to wear it. That's putting their reputation on the line, especially if there's someone who enjoys perfume. Gianni Versace, I don't know that much about because he unfortunately uh, passed away a year after this came out. So he didn't really get to enjoy this for very long. Didn't really get to enjoy it for very long. Uh, this was actually meant to be his replacement signature fragrance. He had been wearing Versace Lome since it came out, probably a few years beforehand, because you know typically designers, when they have a signature created for themselves, they don't release to the public right away. You say the Rawls Pour Own fragrance was his for several years before it became available in the market. Same thing with uh, Eau de Vetiver by Givenchy. He had that as a bespoke fragrance and then eventually allowed a limited amount to be released to boutiques, so on and so forth, all right? So 
Uh, that's really what it boils down to. And there are even some uh, Frederick Mall fragrances that are the signatures of the perfumers who made them, like Uncut Gem. For as many people has have negative or positive opinions about Uncut Gem, Uncut Gem was originally the bespoke signature of perfumer Maurice Roussel, and Frederick Mall talked them into releasing it. So that's why it's available in the market now. But he had wore that for years as his signature scent. Now with this one, this one, uh, for those who have not smelled the Dreamer, I call this a pivotal release. I call this a sort of transitional fragrance because it marks the end of one particular style of this house and the beginning of another. So to edify that a little bit, we need to rewind the clock back to the early 80s when the first Versace perfume came out for women and then was followed a couple years later by Gianni's own signature scent, Versace Loam. In those days, uh, Versace wasn't this huge rock and roll brand that was very extroverted, very over the top. It wasn't this brand that was trying to basically be almost an inversion of what Italian houses were known for. Most Italian houses were very conservative, very buttoned down, suits and pinstripes, dresses, black dresses, conservative fragrances, sheep rays, fougeres, aldehyde florals, right? That stiff sort of continental transatlantic vibe. That's what the Italians did for a long time with both fashion and with fragrance. And Versace was in the beginning more or less towing that line like Armani, like Capucci, like Gianfranco Fair, like a lot of them from back then, okay? So not much different with the early stuff. Once you got a little later into the 80s and 90s, you saw a couple things come out that continued that typical classic Mediterranean theme. On the men's side of the equation, we had Mediterraneo, which was actually a Proteo fragrance originally, but Versace bought them because Proteo was produced by Giver Profumi, the distributor of Versace, and Proteo was getting out of the business. They didn't do so well. So I guess Johnny Versace liked that perfume. Maybe he wore it, I don't know, but he goes, hey, let's, let us take that over. So that Proteo Mediterraneo ended up becoming Versace Mediterraneo. Same bottle, same everything, just different name, you know, on the front. Then things start to change a little bit because that rock and roll thing begins to start, begins to catch on, right? I almost said begins to start, which is like, you know, redundant statement there. But that whole rock and roll aesthetic, and that wasn't necessarily Versace's fault. That was more to do with the fact that, well, musicians loved the brand. The Medusa head, the Greek looking spirals across everything, all of that whole neoclassical vibe just clicked with a lot of rock and roll folks back then. You know, so you started seeing a lot of uh, guitar heroes and, and some hip hop moguls as well got into Versace. They were more Gucci though, honestly, but it just became a celebrity brand. So the fragrances sort of the follow suit with the fashions, things got a little louder. And Gianni Versace, who was queer anyway, right, started to really do a little more queer coating with his fashions and with his perfumes. And we saw that with the launch of Versus Womo, which Versus Womo had basically a leather daddy on the box. So with uh, eagle caps and jack boots, it doesn't get much more obviously gay than that. I mean, the dude looked like Tom, Tom of Finland basically on the box. So the queer coding became a little more obvious. And then the launch of the Versus jeans line. So that ready to wear jeans line that was more accessible to more people. And then Versace with the blue jeans fragrance. And that fragrance was a bit more, uh, a little bit warmer, a little bit richer, a little bit sweeter, a little more extroverted, really. We were heading into that little bit of a clubbing vibe with the Versace perfumes. Something you would see much more later on, obviously, not in the 90s as much, but blue jeans was leading us towards that. But then we had this. We had this, guys. And the idea was, well, obviously, Gianni was showing his true colors a little more, right? Like I said, he was a little more open about his sexuality, a little more open about his personality and everything, and wanted his fragrance, I guess, to reflect that. So 
the Dreamer is a much more flamboyant fragrance than Loam, than Blue Jeans. If you want to count the Proteo fragrance that was relabeled, Mediterraneo, all those were not as flamboyant and extroverted as this perfume. Now, this perfume is not a clubber necessarily. I think Blue Jeans is a little bit sweeter. That one is a little muskier, a little more vibes with the club feel. This is still meant to be basically a signature, meant to be a casual wear everywhere kind of a fragrance, but it has a flamboyant spin to its character. And that flamboyant spin is the juxtaposition of clean musks. So we're talking the hydromersonol, we're talking galaxolide with floral notes. So hydroxycitronellol bringing in the white floral materials, liliol and lyrol, we're talking iris okay iris bringing the white floral quotient into it but then the dihydromersonol and the galaxolide add this sort of fresh dryer sheets vibe to it but the star player of the show the thing that really makes this fragrance what it is clary sage a big fat chunk of clary sage and that clary sage imparts a tobacco feel to the fragrance a very dry leafy unsmoked kind of tobacco feel not like a cigarette we're talking like the leaves are still green and they're being dried in the sun but they're still fresh that's the vibe the hay-like vibe almost fougere adjacent vibe that the clary sage gives you and a lot of people might mistake that for tonka because tonka can do that too but no this is very much clary sage and the thing is you see this in another Italian fragrance from just a few years earlier. 1994, Dolce and Gabbana released the male counterpart of their self-titled 92 fragrance called Dolce and Gabbana Pour Homme. That fragrance was produced by Euro Italia. These guys were still under Giver Profumi at the time, although Euro Italia would eventually make this too actually and the funny thing is the euro italia bottles of this actually smell closer to the dolce and gabbana pour homme than the older giver profumi people who have the old giver profumi bottles will notice it's much more about the musk much more about the linen and the dryer sheets much more about the iris notes right but then if you transition over to the euro italia bottles you will notice that the clary sage and the tobacco notes become more prominent in that formula, which is why a lot of people will say that the Giver Profumi feels more quality, feels rounder, feels sweeter, because yeah, it's focused more on the musk profile and the florals, but when Euro Italia picked up the Versace license to produce the fragrances from Giver Profumi, then Euro Italia really leaned on the Dolce & Gabbana composition they had done and kind of went with that Clary Sage feel. Now, what's really silly about that is <laughs> Dolce & Gabbana moved away from Euro Italia, right? Those of you know who collect that fragrance, Dolce & Gabbana moved away from Euro Italia and went with Procter & Gamble Prestige. And I've heard so many people bemoan the Procter & Gamble versions of that fragrance because Euro Italia, they're Italian, they're prideful, they were not going to sell the formula to Procter & Gamble. They told Procter & Gamble to go fuck themselves in Italian, right? They basically did this to them. So that forced Procter & Gamble to completely reorchestrate Dolce & Gabbana Porum using a really badly done GCMS. They had to GCMS the bottle, figure out what it was, and try and reconstruct it. And those bottles that were made in the UK, they get trashed up and down all night long. I think they're okay. I don't think they're terrible. I think if you find a bottle of that, it's good stuff. You'll enjoy it. Maybe not as round, not as smooth, not as rich as the old Euro Italia. But when Euro Italia picked up this, when Giver Profumi gave, gave, gave it away, gave away, when Giver Profumi did a giver and gave away the license to Euro Italia, Euro Italia basically took this and ironically made this closer to the original D and GPH than the actual reformulation. So people who ask me, they want 
the vintage Euro Italia bottles of DGPH, but they don't want to spend that expensive finder's fee for those bottles, right? They're like, which vintage of, which newer rather, which newer vintage of D&G should they get that's closer to the old one they can't afford, right? And I'm like, none, none. Just buy this. Buy a newer bottle of this. Newer bottle of this will get you closer to the dry down of the old D&G than any version of D&G currently on the market. You will just have to sacrifice your bergamot and just have to sacrifice your lavender and switch out your top notes for the clary sage, the iris, the juniper, the hydromersinol. So you'll get a different top and heart, but once you get down to the brass tacks of it, the dry down with the clary sage is going to feel closer in the newer bottles. If we're talking about Giver Profumi, if we're talking about the original ones, they are going to focus more on the musk, the florals, the sweetness. Not sweet by modern standards, bear in mind. No ethyl maltol in this thing. Tiny bit of vanilla, perhaps. Tiny bit of vanilla. But definitely not anything like you would call sweet now, but sweeter compared to the newer bottles. Newer bottles are a bit drier. They go further into that clary sage. Now, this is very 90s. I will not lie to you guys. Some of you out there, you have a particular hang up with things that smell like they are from their time. You know, if you are a younger cat, I understand. You don't want to get made fun of. You don't want to smell like an old man. And, uh, well, obviously, 1997 was a very long time ago. Okay, so we're talking like, yeah, like, like 27 years ago. <laughs> so, yeah, we're pushing 30 years old for this fragrance. A couple more years, this will be a 30-year-old bottle. And some of you out there are like, well, if it's timeless, if it's timeless and doesn't smell dated, then I can wear it. And I'm like, no, this, this, this will not, this will not get you there. Unfortunately, the way tobacco is presented now is a far cry from the way it was presented back then. Not that any of these tobacco fragrances truly smell like actual tobacco. None of them do, right? It's all fantasy. You see my uh, tobacco note video, you'll know. Most tobacco fragrances tend to focus on a facet of tobacco but none of them try to replicate the actual smell of it because the actual smell of tobacco would be off-putting to most people. So they want that leather sort of fantasy depiction of tobacco, and that's what they get. And in the 90s, in the 90s, that was that dry, uncured, in the sun, like you're on the, you're on the, t the plantation and you're walking through the fields, right, of the leaves. That's the vibe they were going for because the 80s was the heavy smoker's lounge, the ashtray, right, with the clove and the Javanese vetiver and all those smoky notes to make what smells like an ashtray, like a cigar burning, you know. That's the vibe people wanted for tobacco in the 80s, and by the 90s, they didn't want that. They wanted more of that clean, sun-drenched style. So a lot of tobacco fragrances, starting with stuff like Havana in 94, Dolce & Gabbana, also in 94, and then leading up through stuff like this, 97. And in the early 2000s, you have stuff like Very Valentino, which also did that. And that particular style ran all the way until the late 2000s, when Dolce & Gabbana fired back with the One for Gentlemen, right, the 2008. That was more of the sweet, ambery tobacco style that we would see with Tobacco Vanille, and then continue on with One Million, and now all of our tobacco fragrances are super sweet. They all smell like Swisher Sweets. They all smell like uh, Dutch Masters and the little plastic baggies. That's the kind of tobacco we get now. So if you're not a fan of Black and Milds, Swisher Sweets, you're not a fan of Dutch Masters, you have no business with any modern tobacco fragrances because they're all like that. They're all that sweet cigarello stuff. That's just where we are, guys. It's just where we are. I can't help it. So if you... Don't know that going into this and you get this and you smell it and it's dry and it's clean and it's hay-like 
you're not expecting any of that, you're going to be like, you know, because it's going to smell like the 90s. Like I said, it dates itself. Tragically, I guess Gianni Versace got to wear this for all of a year. Less than that, obviously, because he was murdered. But this was meant to be his replacement. And the reason why this is a transitional fragrance, why this is the end of an era and the beginning of a new, is once he was gone and Donatella had to pick up the pieces, she eventually instilled her own aesthetic on the perfumes for both men and women. And the Donatella Versace style is much, much more extroverted and clubber, like I said, than the stuff from the 90s and the 80s. And I like her stuff. Don't get me wrong. I like Versace Man, the purple bottle with the saffron and the grape leaf. Very smooth, very nice. Obviously, I like Eros as well. The original Eau de Toilette with the apple and the vanilla and the three different kinds of cedar wood or whatever. It's very smooth, very nice. Great in the wintertime, not so good. Not so good in the summer. But I like the uh, Versace Man Eau Fresh. That's also very good too. Uh, but just louder though, like I said, louder, bigger, more statement making fragrances because Donatella herself is a very loud statement making kind of woman, you know, and I feel like, uh, she wouldn't talk to a poor person like me, obviously, but I feel like if we were locked in a room for whatever reason, and we had to deal with each other, I think we'd be able to have a conversation because we have a lot in common in that sense. We're, we're opinionated people and we like to talk. So I feel like we'd probably get along. Probably wouldn't be friends afterwards. She'd go back to being a rich person and I would cease to exist. But for that five, ten minute period, it'd be okay, right? <laughs> we get along for that, that short amount of time, I think. But yeah, this is, this is definitely one foot in the old world of Versace and then one foot in the new world. The biggest thing for me, I will close this video out, the biggest thing for me is the fact that this is such a juxtaposition of those synthetic, clean, laundry linen, transparent, aquatic, musky smells, and then the earthier, hay-like, floral. So it's like, on one hand, you've got the laundry aisle, right, at a grocery store. You're at Safeway, you're at Kroger, you're at one of these places, getting a bottle of Tide, box of bounce, dryer sheets, whatever. You're getting your laundry, you're getting your downy, okay? Then on the other hand, you've got, like, the... Uh, lawn and garden department of Home Depot where you've got the flowers growing and you can smell the soil, right? So it's like, on one hand, you've got the laundry section, all the synthetic clean, and on the other hand, you've got a face full of flowers, a face full of hay, all that composty stuff. And the two are typically oil and water to each other. You don't typically find that sheer synthetic minimalism being smashed with that very sort of uh, lucid reality, uh, you know, realistic depiction of materials. But here we go, and they both go whoosh. So it's that perfect marriage of that abstract synthetic vibe and that more feet on the ground kind of vibe that a lot of vintage folks like that style more than they like the abstract stuff. This is right smack in the middle, like Too Faced. It's got a line drawn right down the middle and half of his face is clean and smiley and synthetic. And then the other half is like hay and flowers and juniper herbs and all this other stuff. And the two just kind of don't quite fully gel with each other. They're, they're in constant combat, right? They're, they're constantly, they're using the pugil sticks to beat each other up. The whole time you're wearing the fragrance, it's just a battle with the galaxolide and the juniper and the iris and the hydromyrcinol and then the clary sage. It's, it's a fun fragrance, guys. But above all else, it is very polite. Very polite, very white shirt, very work friendly, but you can overdo it. You can overdo it, you can wear too much. So moderate your usage and you might enjoy this. There you guys have it, Versace the Dreamer. Hope you enjoyed the video, I'll catch you next time.